Good evening, everyone, and welcome um, to the continued celebration of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration Week here at Grand Valley State University. My name is Megan Radecki, and I'm very privileged and honored to be standing in front of you as the new director for the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. Thank you. Uh, truth be told, today is day nine. So if you ask me very specific questions about things, I may not have the answer, but I promise I'll get back to you with the answer at a later time. So again, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I have a long history with the Hauenstein Center. I was part of the second cohort of the Cook Leadership Academy ever. Um, I went on to be a mentor for the CLA, and I've been a Hauenstein groupie ever since. So it is a true privilege to be back with an organization that has been so meaningful in my personal and professional life. And again, um, I'm just thankful for the warm welcome and want to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we are thrilled to be hosting all of you to hear Dr. Mary Frances Berry provide some insightful reflections from her own life and that of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Prior to getting started, I just want to make note of a couple people who are joining us tonight um, from our Board of Trustees, Noreen Myers, um, our VP of Development, Laura Aikens, and also members of the um, Hauenstein Center Advisory Committee. So thank you all for making time for us tonight. Um, in addition, this evening wouldn't be possible without partnership from our friends at the Division of Inclusion and Equity. Um, later on, you'll be hearing from Dr. Marlene Kowalski-Braun, Associate Vice President and Deputy Chief Inclusion and Equity Officer, um, in a few minutes. But first, I'd like to introduce you to one of our very own CLA fellow candidates to share his leadership moment. Breezy Rusher is a fourth year student studying secondary education, psychology, and biology at GVSU. During his time on campus, Breezy has been actively involved with a variety of student organizations, including the African Student Council and National Science Teacher Association. In 2022, he was a founding member of the Educators of Color Network on campus. Breezy is an active volunteer serving on the university's Strategic Retention and Enrollment Planning Committee and Reach Higher 2025. As a first year Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy fellow candidate, Breezy has enjoyed the opportunity to meet and learn from other students with perspectives different from his own. Breezy. Hello, my name is Breezy Rusher and I am a Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy fellow candidate. I stand here before you today with many identities, as a man, as a Catholic, as a person of the BIPOC community, and many others you can ask me about later. But right now, in this moment, I want to emphasize my identity as a student here right now in 2023 at Grand Valley State University. I know this semester has only been two weeks, and one may ask, how much can one student learn in two weeks? What fundamental life-changing thing can a speaker share that happens to them in two weeks. And to be honest, I have to admit, nothing. What I have learned time and time again is that change is not sudden and life altering, but a never ending experience of life. As a student and a lifelong Laker and learner, I will say as many of my heroes have, I've experienced times of highs and lows, good grades and bad ones. And because of that, I will need to have faith to keep at it. See, there's this African proverb I heard growing up, and it goes something like this. If you think you are too small to make a difference, you have never spent a night with a mosquito. You see, I have learned to grow both here in my hometown of Grand Rapids and any other place I go. I have to be ruthless in my endeavor to make change. For many of you think, if, for if many of you think of a bee, you think of something you might fear, but we as a society have deemed them valuable. When you think of a mosquito, many of us dream of their eradication. I personally have a hunch it's because a mosquito makes us all more uncomfortable. It doesn't give up. It makes its presence known, threatened or unthreatened, because it needs a resource. And I want to say as a student, but even more than as a student, as a human being, who desires to be a good leader, we must be intentional, ruthless, planning, adaptable, and overcoming to get the resources we need for our freedom and our desires. For I have always been in a state of change, and because of that, 
I must always be in a strategic state of mind. I plan to become an educator. As a teacher, I may not be able to be on the streets and protest because public decorum says so, but I can create a classroom space where students are free to grow and go where I cannot without risk, risk of missing out on their future. So I say to you, think about what small things you can do in your home, in your work, in your space, to help push for resources we all need as human beings. Whoever your community may be, let them know that action must and will be taken. Just as I am a leader named Breezy Rusher, we must move to action. So, my next action, I would like to introduce Marlene Kowalski Braun, Associate Vice President and Deputy Chief of Inclusion and Equities Office here at Grand Valley State University. Good evening. I'm also honored to be here tonight to add my welcome from the Division of Inclusion and Equity. I work with an amazing group of faculty and staff from across the university through our Inclusion and Equity Institute, where we engage both internally and externally with people, organizations, and communities. We co-create space for learning through sharing, grappling, listening, and engaging in action in order to inspire social justice transformation. As I begin, I must share that I am thrilled to be following Breezy. In my 30 years of higher education, I have always known that the roles of teacher and student are importantly blurred. Our featured speaker has said that each generation has a responsibility to make a dent in the wall of injustice. Breezy, I have greatly appreciated your willingness to share your insights, to hold the institution accountable, and to be in community as we strive to more fully live into our values, so thank you. In my daily work with the Inclusion and Equity Institute, I'm reminded that we are all on lifelong journeys. The lifelong reference, however, is not meant to signal that we can just meander when it comes to anti-oppression work. The urgency of now is upon us as psychological and physiological realities of oppression impact us, our friends, our neighbors, our communities, by lessening life outcomes and dividing us. This is head, hands, and heart work, and we are invited to bring our full selves to this effort. So with this whole person invitation, I have the honor, and we have the honor, of learning from renowned academic and activist leader, Dr. Mary Frances Berry. She has been one of the most visible, respected activists in the cause of civil rights, gender equality, and social justice. Serving as chairperson of the US Civil Rights Commission, Dr. Berry led the charge for equal rights and liberties for all Americans over the course of four presidential administrations. A trailblazer for women and African Americans alike, she also became the first woman of any race to head a major research university as chancellor of the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Berry made history as one of the founders of the monumental Free South Africa movement she received the Nelson Mandela Award for the South African government for her role in organizing and raising global awareness of South African injustice that helped to end over 40 years of apartheid. She also served as Assistant Secretary of Education in the US Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, working to make these historically inequitable systems achieve a new level of fairness. A prolific author, Dr. Berry's books cover a wide range of subjects from the history of constitutional racism in America to the history of progressive activism. Her latest book, History Teaches Us to Resist, How Progressive Movements Have Succeeded in Challenging Times, examines the successful tactics of movements that ended the Vietnam War, that jump-started government response to the AIDS epidemic, that championed the Americans with Disabilities Act and advanced civil, women's, and LGBTQ rights, all of which she was a part of. A moving speaker who makes history come alive, Dr. Berry continues to speak boldly for those who aren't heard, are minimized, and are marginalized. Her clarion call challenges everyone to stand up, to stand tall, and to never give up the fight. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Frances Berry. Thank you very much. I am so pleased that I was asked to come to speak here. And I've had a lovely day um, and met some very interesting and nice people and learned a great deal. And I always do that. That's why I go out to make these talks, so I can meet people and find out what they think. <laughs> uh, and I'm a better person for it and helps me to figure out some things that maybe I hadn't figured out. So this is great. And because I know that figuring out a way to have effective leadership in this country and around the world is one of the most important things that needs to be done because we have in our politics in the United States too often choose between the lesser of two evils. I'm so sick of people, every time there's an election, they say, well, I don't even like this one and I don't like that one, but I gotta pick between the lesser of two evils. <laughs> Maybe sometime we could pick somebody who we really thought <laughs> we ought to pick to do, figure out some way to have effective leadership in this country. Uh, I hope I live to see the day, and maybe this uh, program here, Presidential Studies, and maybe Grand Valley can help us uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, that goal. Every year at this time, I um, find the commemoration of Martin Luther King uh, uh, bittersweet. It's bittersweet for me because on the one hand, I like talking about and remembering his uh, legacy and all the things that happened. And on the other hand, I lament his passing and miss him uh, and miss his voice. Uh, and I also, more than that, since I didn't know him personally but knew Coretta and spent so much time with her over the years after he was assassinated, uh, and after I grew up to be, become a public person myself and we became fellow pilgrims, she called it, in the struggle, <laughs> uh, that I miss her so much. And I miss the conversations about uh, the struggle. I miss the things we did together <laughs> and the things we talked about uh, and how we always would ask each other and say in those long phone conversations, what would Martin do about, she would always say to me, what would Martin do? And I would say, well, what would Martin do about whatever it is we were doing something about or preparing to? And we would not always do what Martin did, <laughs> but we would always ask Martin's question. And she liked holding up the banner very high, which she did, of the accomplishments that he had made. And I also think about here he was, such a young man. I mean, he was 15 when he went to college uh, at Morehouse. And I spent one um, commencement uh, period at Moberlin uh, College, where they were giving me an honorary degree, sitting on the porch at the president's house in great weather one afternoon with Benny Mays, the grand old man who had been president of Morehouse College and was now near the end of his life, who was always also getting a degree. And he taught Martin when he first got there, took him under his wing and helped to make him the person he was. He came as a preacher's son. He was a preacher, but he was a preacher's son. And he was a grand, uh, his grandfather was also a preacher. Uh, but uh, he had a lot, there was a lot of molding that needed to be done. And Benny sat there on the porch and that afternoon, we wilded away and ignored everybody else. <laughs> and he told me all these great stories about Martin and his development. Fifteen. And it was fifteen when he wrote his first letter to a newspaper, Martin did, in which he talked about the need for social justice in, with such eloquence that I couldn't imagine for somebody fifteen years old <laughs> doing that. And even though he somebody's music is playing. Even though he did that and was 15 years old, he was not a good speaker. He never was. We might think because we remember all those speeches that he made and have heard him and so on and forget that, that he had to teach himself to speak 
to audiences without so many pauses and without uh, people not following what he was saying and all the rest of it. In that way, he reminds me of the grand old man, W.B. Du Bois, uh, who was the first black person to graduate from Harvard and with a PhD and, and uh, history and uh, sociology and one of the greatest scholars uh, in, uh, our, uh, in the time that he lived because he taught himself to be able to talk to ordinary people. <laughs> uh, he actually learned it. I mean, he <laughs> practiced and taught, and Martin had to, Martin Luther King had to think about that and figure out how he was going to do that. And think about it, 25 years old, he gets his PhD, and he gets a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and there he is, 29, 25, 29, and then in fact, He's assassinated when he's 39, and that's the end of his life. And I thought I was young and peaking early when I became chancellor and then uh, ran education in the federal government when I was in my 30s. But he got assassinated, and that was the end of him, the end of his life. And so I remember all of that and mull over it and think about it. And I also think about his evolution because I fully believe from learning about him and knowing about him and from my own experience that people evolve, people evolve. One time uh, some people were doing a documentary uh, during the pandemic, one of the many ones that were on TV because everybody was locked down and people had to do something. So some of them were watching TV uh, and there were all these documentaries and I did a couple on Lincoln. And the first one I did, they wanted me to come out and say that Lincoln had been an abolitionist all his life from the time he was a child, which was a lie. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't care if that's what you want me to say. I'm not saying it because it's not true. <laughs> uh, and they made the program and they uh, put in some of what I said, but they didn't put that in there. They had some other people talk about how he was an abolitionist all of his life from the time he was a child and so whatever. And after that, Apple asked me if to do a documentary with them for on Lincoln. And they said, we understand that you think he evolved. And so that's the way he's seen by scholars who worked hard on this. And so we did one that showed he evolved. Martin Luther King evolved. He evolved. He wasn't on this earth long enough to keep on evolving on this earth, but he evolved in the time that he was here. And in important ways that are lessons for us about what to do about the social problems, that the enduring problems that still beset us. I said two or three years ago uh, that I was reminded by Maddie, I said this on Trevor Noah's show, that I thought that we would get consensus around the world on doing something about climate change and that that was the major issue that I thought uh, uh, would be something we would all agree on. I was wrong. <laughs> uh, some people agree and some do not, but I hope that, uh, that eventually there will be. And I hope that there will be consensus around one of Martin's, uh, Martin Luther King's, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, great ideas and uh, something he stood for, which is his idea of the beloved community. The beloved community we try to achieve it in many ways. It simply means that it, everybody is a human being and everybody is important and everybody should have equality and justice and opportunity and all the rest of it. And we should see each other as human beings and not think that somebody is better than somebody else naturally and all the rest of it. And that's hard to do especially when there are fears about the future and what will happen to my group of people if some other people get to have anything and should I worry about them and all the rest of it. But the beloved community, uh, the humanity of all human beings. And there are lots of ways to try to approach that. One way, DEI, diversity and inclusion, which equity and inclusion, which was at first diversity, then diversity and inclusion, and then diversity, equity and inclusion, DEI. And uh, we uh, start out with trying to just end discrimination we talk about when it comes to race and gender, uh, for example, and then we move to identity and all the rest of it. 
But then we uh, talked about affirmative action, and then when the Supreme Court told us we couldn't have that, and then here in the state of Michigan, there was a referendum passed in California saying that we couldn't use that. Uh, Mr. Justice Powell came up with the Bakke case with the idea of diversity, which wasn't his idea. Colleges and universities presented to it to him because they knew they were gonna lose on affirmative action and they wanted to do something. So they said, diversity, why don't we you know, just take race into account? And he uh, said, okay, well, we'll let you uh, do that. And then it becomes diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now the Supreme Court has a case before it, which will be decided this year, in which they will decide whether we can use diversity. <laughs> uh, and they may decide that we can't. And if they do, my suggestion is what we do is we reframe it again and then we call it something else. Maybe banana or, I don't know, hot dog, something. Uh, and go on and do uh, what we have to do uh, and run this race as long as we uh, can run it. Now, the only thing that uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. and the other people, uh, what I call, who I call the Moses generation of our civil rights leaders did was they wanted to align reality, the world in which we live, with the great documents of our national life. And by that I mean the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution. That basically is what they were trying to do, was saying that it applies to everybody. <laughs> and that's what we want to do in a legal sense. And I think in, legal, in a legal sense most of the time anyway. Uh, that's all they were trying to do. It wasn't anything quite remarkable uh, to think about. And so the idea of the beloved community is that you try to reach that somehow. And how do you do it? Well, of course, when he was picked by people to be the leader of the Montgomery uh, boycott stuff, and he was picked, he didn't get up and say, I'd like to be the leader. Uh, uh, how about me? You know, uh, They picked him. Uh, and sometimes uh, stu students ask me how you get to be a leader, and I say, well, leaders are not born with something written on their belly button saying, leader, here I come. <laughs> they uh, become leaders, and movements make people into leaders. The women who became leaders in the civil rights movement, Fannie Lou Hamer, whose name people know, some people know, uh, you need a Blackwell whose name nobody knows. Uh, there are people uh, of both kinds and all kinds who became leaders um, through the process of movement. And Martin Luther King became a better leader as he progressed with what he was doing. He didn't start out knowing exactly what he was going to propose or do or say or whatever. Uh, events occurred and he rose uh, to the challenge. Um, and so I asked Coretta once, why did he speak in 1957? It's just part of his evolution I'm telling you about now, so you can see where I think I'm going. Uh, the, uh, I said, why did he, at the 1957 prayer pilgrimage in Washington, make a speech in which he said that if we ever get the right to vote everywhere, we won't have to worry about justice because we will have great judges who will be fair. Uh, we will have political leaders, presidents, and all kinds of people holding office who will be fair because they know we can vote. Uh, if we have that, we don't even have to ask the government to help us or do anything. Won't that be a great day when that comes, that's 1957. I said to her, why did he do that when the Montgomery bus boycott wasn't done by voting? It was a boycott. It was a nonviolent civil disobedience which succeeded. That's when Rosa Parks sat down on the bus and all that, for those of you who don't know, uh, and even for those of you who do know. And therefore, I said, uh, why would he get up and make a speech <laughs> in Washington to all those people. It was his first speech in Washington. I call it his coming out speech. He came up there, he made that speech as a young man. 
And he spent all that time saying that. I said, he should have known better than that. I mean, I know that there was a Supreme Court case that the NACP filed to give the legal underpinning to the idea that they were mistreated, but it was the boycott that got the change. And she said, she looked at me, she said, because the topic was voting. <laughs> and it was his first speech to a national audience and the elders let him speak. They invited him and he was to talk about voting. So that's why he talked about voting. It wasn't that he didn't know. <laughs> you know he knew, but he talked about voting. And because he thought that voting was important. And he continued to believe that if you got the right to vote <coughs> for everybody, and they in fact voted, maybe someday they wouldn't have to be boycotting and marching and doing all kinds of things like that, everything would happen. That's what he thought at that stage of his life. I'm talking about evolution, that that would be okay. So from then, the whole history of the movement, you have everything, all the marches, all the process, all the people going to jail, the jails filled. You have Selma, where the other day they had a tornado that tore up almost everything in Selma. Uh, all of those things that happened, uh, and in the jails, by the way, the prisons in Mississippi, Alabama, most of the people who were in prison in the protests were women and children. William and, women and children were in the jails, filling the jails. <laughs> in Mississippi, they were mostly women and some of their children with them that were in the jails. And so he was thinking as he went along working for the vote that in fact, we, I know we use the boycott, but maybe we won't have to use this kind of disobedience, civil disobedience, nonviolent, because the vote will give us what. And then he continued to believe that and continued to talk about that and to write about that until something happened. What's happened in Los Angeles? The riots and the over police brutality are in that city. And there were, California was a place where blacks could already vote. <laughs> Wait a minute, if they can already vote, <laughs> why is this happening if his theory is, if you can vote, <laughs> then all this stuff won't be happening to you? I mean, what, there's something incongruous about that. It doesn't fit. And then after that, he went to Chicago. He went to New York in between right after the boycott and with his first book, I think it was Strat Toward Freedom, and he was having book signings in New York City, but he didn't go out to the neighborhoods. And I know that, I've been in book signings, I go places to sign books. He was busy doing that. He didn't go around and check out all the poor neighborhoods and talk, you know, that. That wasn't what he was doing. When he was in Boston, when he and Coretta were in school in Boston, and when they met, he was not going to the poor neighborhoods in Boston. They were with the other students and the people in the academic community and he was reading everything he could get his hands on to learn everything he could about philosophy and religion and all the rest of the stuff. He wanted to be a fully educated man. That was the goal that he had. So he didn't go to those places. But when he went to Chicago, and the civil rights folks invited him there, the housing folks, and he went and he stayed in some of the places and he went to the neighborhoods. And when he talked to people about voting, guess what they said to him? Guess. They said, we've been voting for years. <laughs> the precinct captain comes around here and makes sure that we all line up and you know sign up to vote. <laughs> Do you see these rats and roaches? Do you see all of this poverty? Do you see what's going on with us? And you, all you got to say to us is that we should get ready to vote. <laughs> There's got to be something else. <laughs> there must be something else, Minister, Dr. King. <laughs> and he, by the time he came home, he said, there's got to be something else. <laughs> He evolved, he was forced to evolve and to think about looking at his surroundings better, taking a better look. And when he took a better look, he could see that in Atlanta, 
in Nashville and all the cities in the South, middle class black people had been voting for years. They had been out in the rural areas, people were not. And those poor folks out there who had to be registered and who were under threats of violence and real violence and, and people not giving them work or kicking them off the plantation or wherever they were. But in those cities, they had been voting for years. And in Chicago, they, I mean, if you didn't vote, the precinct captain want to know why you not voting. <laughs> but still, nothing was happening. So he mulled over this and he thought about this. And then there was a war in Vietnam, the war in Vietnam. And he was a pacifist. He was deeply spiritual and he was a pacifist and he didn't believe in violence and he didn't believe in war. And so he had the visceral feeling of being against this idea. And then seeing all the people who came back and seeing people who had what we now call PTSD, they didn't call it that then, who were messed up by the experience that they had had, psychologically messed up. And then thinking about the money that was being spent and how Lyndon Johnson kept saying, and he liked Lyndon Johnson a whole lot. He thought Lyndon Johnson was the best civil rights president we had had, and he was, because indeed he signed the civil rights bills when they came. He didn't reject them and say he wasn't gonna sign them. <laughs> even though he knew that it was politically tense and difficult uh, for him to do so, and for the party, and he was a party man, uh, to do so. So he liked him in a way, unlike his relationship with John Kennedy, who invited him to come to the 100th anniversary of the uh, Emancipation Proclamation in 63, right after Martin had kept asking him to sign an executive order ending housing discrimination because he promised in his campaign, JFK did, I can end housing discrimination with a stroke of a pen. Elect me and I will end it with a stroke of a pen. So Martin kept writing him letters <laughs> saying, you said you could do it <laughs> with a stroke of a pen. You want us to send you a pen? No, he didn't say that. Uh, and all the civil rights types were saying to him, do it with the stroke of a pen. You said you could do it. And, and, and then Martin kept saying he wanted to bring the ministers and come and meet with him. And he could, never could get a meeting to discuss it. So then, but they sent him a nice letter inviting him to come and celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And Louis Martin, who was a black guy who was a newspaper editor from uh, Chicago, one of the best political operatives who ever lived. And whenever Louis liked you, he would always say to you when he saw you coming, he'd do like this, you are a great American. That's what, how you do. But anyway, uh, Louis organized a party for uh, John Kennedy for the Emancipation Proclamation. And Louis told me, he's passed away now, but he told me that I invited every person who was black, he said every Negro, I invited every Negro whose name had ever been mentioned in the press <laughs> to come to this uh, celebration. And I did that because I knew the Republicans, because it was Lincoln and the Emancipation Road, were gonna have a party, probably in Springfield, <laughs> And they were going to invite everybody. So I got there ahead of them and invited everybody so that they would already be invited <laughs> to the White House and they wouldn't go to their party. And he said, and Martin was at the top of the list. And do you know that he wrote back to the president and said, I have no time for meetings for celebration, but I'd be happy to come and watch you do the stroke of the pen <laughs> and sign the executive order. This would be lovely. Uh, and of course he didn't do it. But anyway, um, the, uh, and it took, uh, John Kennedy was another guy who evolved. It took some time for him to get to the point. It wasn't until John, uh, the Meredith, James Meredith incident at Ole Miss that he evolved to the point where he took seriously what the civil rights people were saying. He thought, he and Bobby talked about, I did this, or read about it in the papers uh, for a book I did. They talked about how this is gonna go away. These people will get tired <laughs> and we won't have to be bothered with them anymore. And this is not gonna go anywhere. But by Meredith, when that happened in Mississippi, he changed his mind and he and Bobby became new people on this question. But anyway, uh, he liked Lyndon Johnson. 
very much and appreciated Lyndon Johnson very much. But he said, I got to come out against this war. I got to come out against the war. And I've got to do it. And I don't want to do it. And it gives me pain to do it. But I've got to do it. Look at all that money. And look at all the people, the civilians in the country, and the people here. And what is the outcome going to be? And he had a speech written. And then he read it, and then he said, I can't give that speech. I mean, uh, Johnson's going to be really upset, and maybe I shouldn't do it, and I don't know. And then he asked him the question, himself the questions that he always asked, and then he wrote those questions in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? And he says, you know, the first thing you ask is, uh, is, is, is it something that will be popular? And then if no, then you can tell yourself, well, I don't want to do anything that's not popular, so then you don't do it. <laughs> and you can say, well, is it something that, uh, that, that if I do it, uh, you know, I may get in trouble? And then you say, well, I don't want to get in trouble, so then you're cowardly and you don't do it. Uh, and then you find all these reasons why you shouldn't do it. But the one question you should ask yourself, is it right to do it? And if it's right to do it, you courageously do it. And we used to ask ourselves those questions. Anyway... Uh, he said, I'm going to give the speech. It's like in Jeremiah in the Bible, when Jeremiah says he wants to not say something, but then he must because it's like fire shut up in his bones and he can't be still. And that's what happened to me. He said, that's what happened to me. It was like I could not not do it. I had to do it. So he went and he gave the speech and he talked about how unfair it was and how what we should do is work against militarism, work that as a last resort, you go to war. You talk it to death as long as you can. One of my favorite people, the former chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, is very good at that, talking people to death. If, if Angela Merkel had been chancellor of uh, Germany when this whole Ukrainian thing started, she would have talked both sides to death. They would still be talking now and having meetings and discussions, and she was, she was so good, so wonderful uh, at that. But anyway, uh, he said, you know, we're spending all this money, and we can't do it, and it's wrong, and all these people are dying, and he talks about it, and he was so eloquent when he did it. And that was part of his evolution, too, of seeing how you courageously speak out against something, even when there's somebody you really like who's got the power and the policy and then uh, Lyndon Johnson had a White House conference on civil rights. Johnson was furious when he did that. Uh, and he didn't invite him. He announced publicly that Martin Luther King was not invited. <laughs> and here he was, the Nobel Peace Prize guy. He's the guy who did all these things, and he was not invited uh, to this. And it had a profound effect, not just on him, but on a lot of people, including me, I was a student over in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan, and I was in the anti-war movement, which was big on the campus. And we had protests, we had everything. We were doing everything on the campus. And when I heard the speech, and I listened to it, and then when I thought about it, I said, I have to go to Vietnam. I have to go to Vietnam, and I have to see what's going on for myself. And I have to come back and talk about what I see. And if I make it back, that's what I have to do. But I have to go. I have to find a way to go. It was like fire shut up in my bones. And so I said, how do I get there? I don't know how you, <laughs> how you do this. And I wrote a letter to the Pentagon and I said, how do you go to Vietnam to find out what's going on there? <laughs> they said, you don't unless you're in the military or unless you are a reporter, you can't do that. Nobody else is invited in there. So I sat up there and I thought, well, how do, you know, so I wrote to them again and I said, well, how do you become a reporter? Because <laughs> I knew I wasn't doing the military. And so they wrote back again. It was amazing. And they said, you have to get 200,000 subscribers to have you as their reporter for you to go. And they were thinking newspaper, you know, they weren't thinking social media or digital, whatever. 
And so I went over to the Michigan Daily newspaper, the student newspaper on campus, and I said, how many subscribers do you people have? <laughs> and they said, well, we got about 70,000 if you consider alumni and this and that and the other. I said, how would you like to have a war correspondent? They said, that's a great idea. Who is it? I said, me. They said, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And they said, you want to be a war? I said, yeah. They said, oh, cool. You know, that's great. We don't have any money. How you? <laughs> what are you going to do? I said, OK, just write a letter saying I'm your war correspondent and put my name on it and you get the editor. Or the, I, we got the student editor to sign it. And then I left, I had 70,000. So I said, how am I gonna get the rest of these people? <laughs> so I went to all these little towns around Ann Arbor and talked to the people at the paper. And each one of them, I said, would you like to have a war correspondent? <laughs> and they all said, yes. And then I all said, me. And then I, they figured I was the only person asking. So they said, okay, but you have to write hometown news. If you run into people who are from here, who are in the military, you gotta interview them and send us stories back, and you send the stories back, on, you telex them, and you gotta send us a story at least once a week. But we don't have any money, nobody had any money. So I got all of them to write letters, sent them to the Pentagon, and they sent me back a letter saying, here are your credentials, you're a reporter for these folks, and show up at the Rex Hotel in downtown Saigon and get all your military gear, and you can go out in the field anywhere you want to go, as long as you make it there. You can hitch rides on planes, you can do whatever, walk with people, whatever. And when you're in the field, you sleep with the officers and eat in their mess. And when you're in Saigon, you're on your own. <laughs> and you get there however you can, okay? And so I then had, what, a problem of trying to get a ticket. How was I going to get <laughs> to Saigon. I didn't have any money to go to Saigon. Uh, so I went around and begged from all of my compatriots in the uh, anti-war movement, and we got enough money for me to get a plane ticket. So I went, and I got on the plane, and there were all these reporters, like real reporters on the plane. <laughs> and they said to me, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to cover the war. I'm a war correspondent. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, who are you working for? And I told them my story. And they just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Uh, but then they sort of said, OK, well, we'll tell you how to be a reporter, <laughs> what you have to do and what you're going to. Some of us have been there all that already. We're back. And here's what it's going to be like. And well, here's what you have to do. And one of them gave me his notebook, a little notebook to take notes in. He had a couple of them. I still have it because I used it to take notes when I was in Vietnam. And uh, we stopped off in Guam, and we went to Bangkok. And I was thinking, well, when I get to Saigon, where am I going to stay? Because they told me when I'm in Saigon, I have to stay you know, wherever I can. I don't know anybody. And so I got on the plane. Uh, we stopped in Bangkok. And a guy got on the plane and sat down next to me and started talking. It turned out he was one of my brother's fraternity brothers. <laughs> my brother didn't know him, but they were in the same fraternity. And he was a foreign service officer, US, uh, USAID stationed in there. And I told him my story. He said, well, when you're in Saigon, come over and stay at the house where there are about five of us FSOs there, and you can stay with us. And bring your dirty clothes, and the people will wash them. <laughs> and you can get some food and eat and get some rest. And come on, go with me. And I did. So anyway, I went out in the field. I went all the way from down in the uh, bottom of Vietnam all the way up to the DMC, everywhere. I was with the Army. I was with the Navy. I was with the Marines. And I did a lot of hometown news, and I talked to a lot of soldiers. And some of it was very sad. Uh, I met a lot of people who were hometown players, and I wrote stories about them, which I sent dutifully back by telex to the people. And then I had a hanger-on who was a Swedish guy who was head of Swedish news broadcasting in Washington, and they had dumped, sent him there, the Swedish government. They were against the war. And they sent him from Washington because he kept writing stories that seemed favorable. So they said, go see for yourself. <laughs> and they said, get on a plane and go there. And he got there, and he didn't want to be there. So he sort of glommed on to going around with me everywhere and complaining. 
But I loved it because when we were lying down on a tarmac out in nowhere, waiting to see if some plane came by to pick us up, he'd tell me stories about the most delicious Swedish smorgasbord. He'd give me every detail of everything he ate and how it was and all the rest. I said, wow, this is great, because we weren't eating that. And he was a wonderful guy. Uh, and finally, one night he said to me, we were somewhere going someplace, and he said, you know what? The United States is not winning this war. <laughs> I said, Bjorn, you actually noticed <laughs> who owns the night here. Um, and uh, coming back, I was glad I went. And I didn't get killed, uh, obviously. Uh, they assigned a sergeant to me to go around with me everywhere to make sure I didn't. They said, he's going to make sure you don't get killed. That's the way they talk in the Army. Anyway, uh, and he spent most of his time running around trying to keep up with me because I'd be, you know, way down here somewhere. Um, and they did that because the only woman who was there uh, covering uh, the war before that, there were other women from, there was a French woman and some other people, and later a lot of women who went. They, uh, she, her name was Dickie Chappelle, and she was a photographer for Life magazine, the Pulitzer Prize winner. And she stepped on a landmine shortly before I got there and was killed. And so they wanted to make sure that I didn't get killed. So this sergeant was supposed to make sure uh, that I was safe and to watch me everywhere I went. And um, by the time, I won't tell you all the bloody, gory stories, but I will tell you this one, that um, I came back more formally against war and in favor of peace and still am. Uh, in all cases, in, if you can talk it to death, uh, because you probably saw the pictures of those people in Afghanistan trying to grab onto the planes when they were leaving. Well, in Vietnam, and I'm sure this happened to other places, uh, we would be in the middle of a firefight, say a couple of reporters, and we were dropped down. We were with the troops because we went everywhere we could go. Um, and um, then there would be a firefight and we would be in danger and our troops and us, we were about to get uh, annihilated and they would send in a caribou plane or send in helicopters to get us, to drop down and get us um, out of there as quickly as they could, as with any people that we could bring with us. And we would take as many people as we could, the caribou would take uh, more. Uh, this is hunting country, so maybe you know what a caribou is. Hunters use it, a big plane. They can land anywhere. Um, and once we got to ready to go in the air, people would grab onto the plane, women and children and old people, trying to get on the plane with us and screaming and yelling and being shot and killed right before our eyes because we couldn't take anybody else. And that didn't happen just once. It happened over and over and over. And also, some of the guys that I did hometown news on got killed, okay, after I'd done the hometown news on them. Or up on the DMZ at Contien, which is right on the DMZ, a uh, Marine embattlement up there, uh, which the uh, Marines called uh, hell in a very small place. Um, you'd see people going out, our guys going out in the DMZ and getting killed out there with the encounters. But anyway, all it just made me more firmly convinced that Martin was right and that peace was something we want. So things uh, evolved for him, back to Martin again. Um, and that, as well as Watts and Chicago and all the rest, had this influence on him that he became firmly convinced that he should do what he did when he wrote Where Do We Go From Here, which was the last book that he wrote. And in Where Do We Go From Here, what he says is that, yes, you should vote. Voting is very important. But you should also engage in nonviolent civil disobedience you, and protest activity and organize strategically in order to get politicians to do what you want when you vote for them. So you voted, then what? What do you do then? <laughs> How do you get that if you really care about poor people or homeless people or you care about racism or you care about sexism or 
whether you care about what people do to people who, uh, whose identity they don't appreciate or whatever it is, then what do you do if you believe the political system is the answer and that politics is the answer, then why don't you uh, uh, put some kind of pressure on them? Politicians respond to pressure. And I know this from being in politics. I'm not a politician. I could never be one. I don't, I'm not able to talk in terms that obfuscate rather than enlighten. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and I can't always go around talking about everything as apples and oranges. Anyway, uh, the uh, idea is that you must make, it's as I say in my book, History Teaches Us to Resist, when Franklin Roosevelt said that if A. Philip Randolph wanted him to issue an order saying that blacks could work in the defense industry, he had to make him do it. He said, he got to told Eleanor, he's got to make me do it. I'm not gonna do it unless he makes me. Lyndon Johnson did that and signed those bills because Selma and all the protests and with white people, black people, everybody who believed in justice coming there and bringing pressure to bear in the South. Uh, politicians respond to pressure. There are lots of people who have things to ask and want them to do stuff. I mean, everybody, you know, <laughs> wants them to do their thing. And some people know that and understand it. And you have to use the legislative process, like those women did out there in uh, Kansas, and not just women and men who supported them when they were trying to get the uh, keep abortion safe and legal, uh, when they acted politically to get the legislature to do what they wanted to do. People, whatever your issue is, people have different issues and had take different sides on issues. And I don't care what, you know, if that's your side, but you have to understand that you cannot make social change on the big issues that occur in our country if in fact you don't mobilize. I have people telling me that they care and are concerned about what's happening in the schools and school boards being taken over. In Tennessee, where I'm from, Nashville, we have fights all the time in Tennessee at these school boards all over uh, where people are trying to stop them from teaching uh, history uh, as it uh, was, as opposed to where what they'd like it to be and it has been and what they know and what makes them feel comfortable. And uh, I, there are people who say to me, I'm not going to the school board meeting because I don't want to fight with those people. And I don't feel like having arguments. And I say, well, if you don't more organize and you don't have arguments and you don't go to the meetings, <laughs> you're gonna lose. <laughs> and they're gonna be comfortable with their racism or sexism or whatever it is, whatever kind of is, ism, ism that they got, you know? And you got to be in the struggle. You got to be uh, in the fight. And um, so this is something that he believed in, and this is what he said, and where do we go from here? And too often, we're getting ready to gear up again for another political campaign. People start to talk again about, you know, let's get ready, you know, what for the whatever. Uh, and there are all these issues, with homelessness. You know, do we really care about the increases in homelessness? Do we really care about the causes of crime and the underlying things that happen? Do we really care about the schools? Do we really care about the cost of higher education and the student debt that people have? Do we really care? If we really care about all these things, Martin would say, then that means we ought to organize, and that's what I say in history teaches us to resist. Um, and we cannot do make decisions about what to do about whether it is popular. I have often said that if Rose Barks had taken a poll before she sat down on the bus, she would have just kept on standing up. I mean, because the poll would have shown what? Nobody's gonna support you, <laughs> nobody cares <laughs> what happens, and the poll result says don't do anything, you know? Um, and don't let, you know, he would say, don't let politicians and the people who are in public life fool you by telling you and explaining things to you that they're so simple and you just do this or that or the other. No, and have some moral authority in what you do. And so what this means to me then, it is true as I have often said, that each generation has to take up the battle because freedom is a constant struggle. Once you got the Moses generation to show us where the promised land is, 
And Martin points us toward where it is. And he's been distorted. Uh, the, uh, in 1980, uh, there was a move which was successful to start or, uh, reinterpreting Martin Luther King. And that Martin Luther King said that you should not talk about color or race or the color of people's skin. You should just talk about, you know, the content of their character. That's what he said. He didn't say that. There's no way he would have said that. And he didn't say it, but he's dead. He belongs to the ages. What he said was, someday I hope that we will be able to <laughs> judge people by, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of the character. Someday, did you get the someday part? And the someday part means that if you do all these things that are necessary to be done, if you put yourself out there, if you do something and work for justice and fight for justice, then someday we will have a country where the, all of that will be true. But it has been taken to mean, and you see it a lot, with, I hear people talking about it a lot, if you say anything about let's do something about race relations, or let's do something about any of these issues, they say, but you're not, you don't believe what Martin Luther King said. You shouldn't even be raising that issue. You should just be talking about the content of my character. You know, and I'll be happy to tell you what that is. It's really good. <laughs> so you have to do that. And it is true that each generation must make its own den in the wall of injustice. I used to think that I was going to make all the change in the world. And I said, now, Martin wasn't able to make it all before he got killed. But I'm, and with the people I know, we're going to change the world. I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> but I do believe in incremental change. And I do believe that um, uh, history shows that if you organize, if you're persistent, if you have moral uh, authority, that in the end you can prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody needs to get on their feet and stretch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have a uh, question or a comment or anybody like to testify? That's what they do in my church. They get up and say, I just want to testify. Yes. Yes, go on and testify. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. I remember you from helping organize a rainbow. Yes. And we I did. were in Washington a lot. Yes. Washington, D.C. And my name is Paul Mayhew. Okay. And I was state chair of the Rainbow Coalition. All right. In Michigan. Mm -hmm. And we won Michigan for Jesse's presidency. Yes. And we talked about operational unity. Yes. I love that term. I do too. Because you don't have to be falling down in love with people to make a move. And we don't have to be always, you know, hugged up with each other to make a power move. That was some wisdom that Jesse espoused. And I, in fact, just a couple of days ago, I was explaining to a part of the community how this operational unity worked. I'm proud to see you. I've saw you many times before in D.C. And did we ever get statehood? No. Okay. All right. And That's it. I'm going to stop. I don't want to hawk this, okay. Mike, but I like the way you talk. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Jesse, Jesse Jackson, you know, has Parkinson's, and he's very ill. You know this. But the thing is that the rainbow was a great idea. Uh, putting all the people. It was the, a way, another way of doing the beloved community yeah. at Martin's beloved community, putting all the peoples uh, together. Um, and um, um, somebody ought to push that um, again or some idea that's, you know, similar to that. Um, and the other thing is sometimes we're told that if we have, we can't really do anything, people who are progressives, because we're a minority and a minority can't do anything. A minority in terms of numbers. 
And when you're a minority in terms of numbers, you can't do get anything done. You got to just, you know, either get somebody to help you or you just have to give up and accept whatever it is. You know, those people in the House of Representatives who just executed whatever they did, all the stuff they did and around the state, they were a minority. The only thing I noticed about them, I didn't pay attention to what they were trying to get, whatever it was. But I said, these people are not a majority, they're a minority. Now, how did they do this? Because we're told that if you're a minority, you can't get anybody to give any concessions or do anything or whatever. And part of it is persistence. And part of it is whatever it is you're trying to get, believing you can do it. But it's also when we were doing the Free South Africa movement, the lawyers who we got to come to be available voluntarily to get us out of prison when they arrested us, they agreed they'd do that, but they said, you shouldn't be having a movement. You shouldn't be having an organized movement against apartheid. You shouldn't be doing this. They came over to my house while we were meeting. We met over my house every day for a year and a half in the morning uh, and said, uh, just go to court, you know, or something. Uh, go talk to your congressman or something. I said, we're not going to vote the end of sanctions and the end of apartheid. It's not going to happen. You shouldn't have this movement. If we had listened to them, we never would have done it. You know? And things aren't perfect in South Africa. There are all kinds of problems. But still, the people there have the right to make a choice themselves and decide what they're going to do. Uh, do they have the courage to take the next step or not? So you, if you organize the people who did the Americans with Disabilities movement, which I write about in History Teaches of this, which was a magnificently organized and run movement, they had the right idea and they had strategy and they worked on it for years and tried different things until they got it to fit right. They came in the building, the headquarters of the Health Education Welfare, where I was uh, an assistant secretary, and they took over. They had wheelchairs. They had all kinds of stuff, and they took over the first floor, and the next thing I heard was the uh, phones, the red phones ringing in our offices, all of us political appointees from the secretary upstairs. Run, come up here. You need to meet right away. So we all ran up there. What is wrong with this man? And he said, there are all these disabled people down there in the lobby. So, <laughs> well, they're protesting. They want me to sign the regulations for Section 504. That's the one that made for sidewalk cuts and all of the accessible stuff for people uh, who have disabilities. And I won't sign them because the, 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 the corporations aren't ready for me to sign them. They think it's too expensive and blah, 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 blah. He just went on and on. But what am I going to do? They're down there in the lobby. <laughs> We said, well, why don't you give them, he was talking to the wrong people, uh, because all of the people, the young people there were like me, you know, they sort of like, well, so, and so we said, well, why don't you give them some alpha of a donut and something to drink? That would be something good <laughs> you might do. They might be thirsty, you know. Well, why would I, I said, just do it, tell the people to do that. And he did that. And then finally, they decided to leave because the press didn't cover them because there was no confrontation. Press likes confrontation or they like, you know, visuals. Then they didn't give up. They had all of the regional offices all around the United States where there were HEW offices, had disabled people go to those offices <laughs> and take over the elevators and everything else in the building. And they got press, okay? If the media doesn't cover you, it doesn't happen, okay? They got press. And then the next thing they did, they came back to Washington and they went, well, some of the guys from San Francisco got a truck, a van that they uh, went, that had chairlifts on it so they could bring disabled people and people on stretchers and went in front of California's house and protested, okay? Then they went to President Carter's church and stood outside quietly with all the disabled people on stretchers and people with all kinds of things and stood there each time he went to church. After about, hmm, it took about two months, <laughs> California said, well, I guess I better sign these regulations. <laughs> and he signed them. 
so that it is possible if you are persistent then when they wanted ADA passed at the last minute after all the work that was done the Americans with Disabilities Act they couldn't get it passed in the Congress on that last day and some of you may have seen the pictures because some of the children a little girl who was disabled and who had cerebral palsy came to the steps of the Capitol and fell out of her wheelchair deliberately and climbed all 83 steps of the Capitol. And when she did that, other people did the same thing. And by the time they got to the top, the Congress went inside and passed the bill, okay? They had said they weren't gonna pass it. So there are ways to get things done. And uh, anybody else got anything you wanna say, questions, you wanna ask, comments? You can't say anything else. Somebody else get to say something. Anybody else, anybody over in this place, you, you folks got anything to say or you, you can criticize if you want to and say that everything's perfect, okay? Man, my name is Ryan and yeah. uh, with your anti, when you reflect on your life and your effort in accessibility, anti-war, dismantling of apartheid, civil rights, uh, and when you reflect on your life and work to date, do you have a moment or a, a an achievement that you would consider the, the proudest of your life? Uh, I think the, the, um, the anti-apartheid stuff and actually being finally in uh, South Africa when Nelson got out. I had been there several times uh, surreptitiously over the years. Um, and then spending time with Nelson when he came to this uh, country each one of us who had been the leaders of the movement uh, spent a whole, got a day with him, the whole day with whatever we wanted to do. He and I sat in his hotel room while we watched old sitcoms of, uh, uh, what is the, uh, Ralph, whatever his name is, that guy who was a, what is it? Huh? No, this was the guy who was the, it was a sitcom. It was a guy, he talked bad about his wife all the time. And uh, the honeymoon, no, not honeymoon. Was that the name of, what was the name of that program? You guys are too young to know it? What program, you don't know what I'm talking about? Damn, I can't, what? Yeah, Jackie Gleason. Nelson loved Jackie Gleason uh, and his wife. And he loved them because the, um, when he got out, when he was in prison, and at first, and we was in Robbins Island, it was terrible, and he, there was no communication or anything. And then in the last year, as the protest heated up, they moved him to a house, and the house had a TV set. They were preparing, because they knew eventually they're gonna have to let him go. And they let him watch TV, but all they let him watch TV was old sitcoms. So he fell in love with Jackie Gleason and the Outer Towners, the Downtown Honeymooners, or whatever they were called. And, um, and the day that I spent with him, I said, well, what would you like to do today, uh, uh, Baba? And he said, well, we're going to watch the sitcom, sit down. So we laughed and we talked and we had a good time. Uh, and then le early in the afternoon, I haven't told anybody this story except once, and there's no press here, so I can tell you. There's no press, right? Oh, I can't. Can I tell? Is there any press here? Okay. Uh, they, they, he said, uh, he, we were sitting there talking and talking and talking. And uh, Winnie was somewhere, she had gone to something. And she came in. And when she came in, he said, hello, oh, my old lady. Nelson said that to her. And she threw her pocketbook at him and said, what are you doing calling me an old lady, you old man? And, and, and he said, well, on the TV, the Americans call their wives the old lady. I'm just doing what the Americans do. That's what you're supposed to do. Call your wife my old lady. Because that's what Ralph or whatever his name was on the show did. That was the funniest thing I ever saw <laughs> that happened. But I think that that was important to me, being able to do that. Uh, and the other thing was the fight that I had with uh, Ronald Reagan, who I found personally to be a very nice man. He was as affable as he appeared. Uh, but uh, we had political fights. And when he finally told the press that he wanted to fire me because I was serving at his pleasure and I didn't give him very much pleasure. <laughs> and the reporter reported that, but I was proud of that. But mainly it was the anti apartheid thing. Anybody else got anything? Nothing? Okay, all right.
Thank you very much. Well, what a delightful evening for all of us to sit, and I think we could listen to many more stories um, if we had the time, but let's, let's take a moment to thank again Dr. Mary Frances Berry for her life and work. Um, I think we all heard a lot of themes that we'll take with us tonight. Um, really, you talking about transformation and the evolution of Dr. King, I think is something interesting that maybe some of us haven't heard before. So as we live in a culture today where we don't have a lot of grace around being one person one year and then evolving into maybe something different or more enlightened in the next year or even decades later, I think it gives us all pause to think about who we are as leaders, who we're becoming, and what we see and expect of the leaders around us as well. So thank you for that. Uh, this brings us to the close of our formal programming tonight, but we hope you'll join us out in the exhibition hall for some community conversations and dessert. Um, you'll see on the screens there's some conversation prompts, so we hope that you'll use those, but engage further, talk to meet some new people, talk about what you heard tonight, and what we might do with that as we leave, um, as we leave this event. Um, also, there, we will have sales of Dr. Berry's book, and she will be signing History Teaches Us to Resist, so be sure to grab a copy of that if you don't have one already. Um, and certainly, we look forward to seeing you at our next event, which will be a wheelhouse talk with Dara Richardson Heron next Friday at the Eberhard Center. Um, and we invite you to um, check out the website online, houndsteincenter.org, for future programming that we have coming forward. Um, one minor housekeeping issue, if your name is Grace, we may have found something of yours. It's in my pocket, so come see me afterwards. Um, and aside from that, I just want to thank you all again for being here. Um, thanks to our partners in the Division of Inclusion and Equity for helping host such a wonderful week. And um, I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.